awesome, great, glorious day it is. This is the day the Lord has made, and indeed we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Remember to subscribe, share, and like. Tell a friend to tell a friend to watch the Omuvanga podcast where we aim to transform, inform, as well as inspire. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is one whose life speaks of volumes when it comes to empowering the young generation to take the mantle of revival and change in the nation. He is an expert in talent discovery and leadership development, a doctor of philosophy with a degree in religious studies, a doctorate in leadership, man leadership and management, and a doctorate of business administration. Our guest is also the senior pastor of Redeemed Christian Church of God, RCCG, in Zambia, and founder of the Happiness Foundation International. He is a husband to one wife, proud father of five children, and is a multi-talented individual with a burden to transform lives through his lifestyle and passion for growth. Let us put our virtual hands together for the one and only Dr. Patrick Osagi. Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank welcome. you, thank you. So I was even wondering who you are introducing. <laughs> <laughs> so many titles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Glad, glad to have you. Awesome, um, awesome. As, Thank as you for the opportunity when, to be here. When you entered, I was reminding you the first time I interacted with you, and that wow. was like uh, seven years ago. I so, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and Good. I'm still doing what I was doing. Yes. <laughs> and on fire and on fire from one level of glory to the oh, other. Oh, God. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> yeah. So first things first, for somebody who's watching this and mm. they are wondering to say, who is uh, Pastor Osagi? Who is Pastor Osagi? Wow, that's a that's a that's a, mm -hmm. a a lot to unpack. Yeah. Um, I will just start by saying I'm, I'm a person who loves God. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about people. Yeah. Uh, my bias is towards the young people yeah. because I believe that when once you once you God has given you a platform, God mm -hmm. has given you a, a influence or success. Yeah. Those things are not really for you. Mm -hmm. They are for you to use as an opportunity to build a platform. Yeah. And you know, um, a place of influence for the young people. So yeah. I'm very passionate about young people. I'm passionate about talent discovery and this development. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've spent most of my life doing that and working with young people to achieve the same. Yes, I'm a pastor. I'm serving under the redeemed Christian Church of God. Uh, pastor a church parish called Power Assembly. Mm -hmm. I started over almost three years ago. And uh, I'm the pastor in charge for what is called uh, Lusaka Province One, mm -hmm. and also the youth and young adult um, um, leader, special assistant, yeah. as we call it in the church, mm -hmm. for youth and young adults for mm -hmm. the southern block of Africa, yeah. for the redeemed Christian Church of God. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a man who loves God, loves revival, loves, loves to see the move of the Holy Spirit in our generation. Mm -hmm. I love to see the church on fire for Christ. And I love to see Christians, mm -hmm. you know, being wealthy and relevant. That yeah. is, they must be heavenly heavenly, expectant, and prepared, but earthly relevant. The Christian must live a balanced life. Yep. So that's the summary of who Pastor Osage is. I'm an artist. I write songs. I'm an actor. I, I do movies. I write songs. I, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> okay. It's like when I was coming into the world, God gave me multi of talents <laughs> and gave me a lot of things to work. I'm a writer. Yeah. I do a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. I design homes. I'm also an interior decorator. I do, I'm into culinary issues. I do, eh, Okay. It's a lot. Okay. Yeah. A lot. I, I, I put my hand in a lot of things. I'm an instrumentalist. I also, I'm a jazz musician. I also do a lot of jazz songs and all that. I'm a saxophonist and the list goes on. I'm a father, <laughs> you know, all I know. I don't even know which one to put my hands into. But yeah. at the end of the day, the summary is that I love God and I'm passionate mm -hmm. about people and especially the young people. Awesome. Yes. So uh, where, where do you hail from? Because uh, um, as you can tell, I am I'm from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I'm from East a state called Delta State. Okay. I'm from a local government called Ika Northeast Local Government. I'm from a town called Akumaz Umocha. Mm -hmm. I'm also from a, a village called Dumobi, which is the means in my language, the royal village. Because mm -hmm. I am a, a a part of a royal family. My my family is the one ruling the Akumaz people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you go into that part of the that part of Nigeria, and you just mentioned the name of Sagi, they will know. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, my, the present king of the Akumazi people, we share the same great grandfather, okay. actually. Yes. You know, so it's probably like my cousin, as mm -hmm. it were. 
so that's where I come from. That's where I, but I've been in Zambia for over 25 years. Yep. And it's interesting that I've lived the exact number of years in Nigeria as mm -hmm. I've lived in Zambia. It's just interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I came to Zambia as a 25-year-old missionary. Okay. And I've lived here for 25 years also. And you recently celebrated your 50. Yes, yes, yes. 50, five, zero, half a century. Yeah. <laughs> That's how my children describe it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah. Uh, so walk us through your journey in uh, Christianity. Because I do understand that our African setup or upbringing relies so much on ancestral spirits, ancestral powers. And you, as you rightly put it, you coming from a royal household, there's a lot involved yeah. in that. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Okay. So my full names are Patrick Davidson Madabo Chiku Osage. Mm -hmm. um, so that that ex a description of who I am based on my name mm -hmm. tells you a lot. Patrick definitely means that I must have had a Catholic background because <laughs> I mean that already tells you that that nomenclature means that yeah you know um, because Saint Patrick was a, a an Irish missionary that affected yes. the whole of Ireland, and mm -hmm. his impact is still felt to today. This is because you know? they have St. Patrick's yeah, Day. Yeah, like, yeah. Yes. I mean, Davidson is a name I gave myself because after I came of age, I realized that I need to add something that can transmit to my children mm -hmm. uh, to represent a man I love very much in the Bible, which is somebody that I follow. And we have a lot of similarities when it comes to life. He was a musician, a prophet, a writer, a, a leader, a man who believed in the development of young people. The mm -hmm. list goes on and on. And that's David. You yeah. know? And then, of course, Mother Broch, which is my Nigerian name, which is my, my traditional name, mm -hmm. you know, uh, means a man is not God. Or like you say in Nyanja, Muntu Simulungu. <laughs> it's the same word. Yeah. You know, then Osage. Osage means God sent. Mm -hmm. It means a man who God has sent. Okay. You know, so that background uh, affected my own relationship with God. So my, my parents were, um, they lived, they left the village and lived in Lagos. So because they lived in Lagos, a lot of their um, traditional norms and operations were affected because mm -hmm. now the culture upgraded because they moved. So my dad, when by the time I arrived, I found my parents were Catholics. Yes. You know, and I still remember that um, after some conversations with my parents, they even gave me the day I was Christian or named. Yes. They gave me Patrick and I had a godmother and mm -hmm. godfather, as it mm -hmm. were, you know, from the Catholic tradition. And those ones are the ones who swore that they were going to now take, care um, take me up and take me up in the work, Christian work with God. Yes. You understand? So from a very early age, you know, I've had a bias towards God. It's like, it's like something draws me. In fact, my mom used to say that I could... Um, every other public place I avoided except the church. Okay. It seemed to be that the church is the only place where I felt comfortable, mm -hmm. the only place where I felt like I could do a lot, the only place where I felt I was relevant, mm -hmm. you know, as a child. Ima imagine she even told me one time that um, when there's a baby born in a house, I will refuse to go because there will be a lot of people. But when there's church, it's time for church, she doesn't even need to ask me. Yep. I will be ready to go and dress up. So that's how I began my journey. You know, then because of the Catholic background, mm -hmm. I became introduced into Catholicism and then rose up. By the time I was seven, I was taking what we call our Holy Communion yes. and all that. Uh, as at that time, the only thing I had not done in what the Catholics call their seven sacraments is yes. death and marriage. Okay. You know, I'd so accomplished all that at a very young age that they started leading me towards becoming a priest. Okay. So that as far as I was concerned, I was a righteous person. I was born again. I'm not the kind of guy who says he's a sinner. Because mm -hmm. I'm not the kind of guy who lies or steals. Or I mean, if you look at when it comes to works, I, I mean, I'm the kind of guy you can say is a heaven person. Mm -hmm. You know? But then I began to get interactions and get exposed to different preachings. The yeah. first one was Pat Robinson, 700 Club, where he was talking about how a person needs to be born again. A person needs to give their life to Christ. Mm -hmm. and that was my first initial encounter with the salvation message. Yes. And then, you know, I gave my life to Christ on TV, 700 mm -hmm. Club, and then began from there. Because there was no follow-up, I drifted back to what was the normal one, a, a, the normal practice of just being mm -hmm. uh, a Christian, nominal Christian. Mm -hmm. Then, just when I turned 14, 15, 1989, a couple of young guys, my classmates, came to my class and they were witnessing Mm -hmm. You know, and they spoke to me about Jesus and repeated the same message that man on TV was saying. Okay. And I realized that, oh, actually, 
um, salvation is not by works. You are not yeah. born a Christian. You yeah. can't be born into a Christian family. Mm -hmm. You need to be born again. Confess your sin. Give your life to Christ. Believe in him. Yes. Repent from it and then become a Christian. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened to me. So after those guys um, spoke to me, I realized that there was a need for me to be saved, that my works cannot save me. Yeah. That what can save me is accepting the righteousness of Christ mm -hmm. and becoming, you know, a Christian through that confession of the mouth and believing in the heart. So that's exactly what I did in 1989. Mm -hmm. I remember it like yesterday, you know. It's, it's, it's an experience I will never forget. And I remember the very first thing that happened to me is that this, the sense of a heavy burden is the first thing that left, mm -hmm. and it was replaced with joy. Okay. I mean, I couldn't explain it, you know. And I think one of the things that got me, my attention, was the, 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 the they introduced God to me as a father figure, not as a yeah. person to serve. Okay. But as a person to have a relationship with, that okay. one is the one that struck me. Because I, from the, my, my background, I knew God as a person to serve, mm -hmm. not a person to have a relationship with. You understand? So if that, that has even um, affected even my present position in Christianity yeah. and about my work with God. Mm -hmm. Because I have never seen God as a person to serve. Okay. I've always seen him as a person to fellowship with, interact with commune with and if he has something an assignment for me to do i do it not based on his reward but because i love him it is my father's assignment to love people that's mm -hmm. why i love people i'm not doing it because i want him to give me something in fact i still remember the very first time somebody gave me an honorarium 1989 mm -hmm. i was shocked i was this <laughs> said no he just brought something little for you just to transfer I said, oh so you, you guys get paid for this thing. Said, what's going on here you know so even in my christian journey Everything about me has been like that. It is relationship first. Okay. Service follows. So the service is not based on reward. The service is based on relationship. Okay. Those are two different things I've said now. Mm -hmm. Because you see, um, okay, I've even started preaching. Because you see, when you when your service is based on when your your relationship with God is based on service, mm -hmm. you will be triggered by reward. Yes. But when your when your relationship with God is triggered by relationship, you'll be triggered by the, the, to please the master. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes. Because now you're a son. So one is a slave, a servant, the other one is a son. Yes. And they are two, they are same, they are in the same house. Yeah. They have the same person. But you see, the slave and the servant release to the master, to the to the owner as master. May I release with him as father. Mm -hmm. So that slave, he can't enter his bedroom. True. But I will. Yes. There are certain things I will know. That slave will never know. Yes. You know? So that, that's that is my journey as a Christian. And got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1989. I still remember it like yesterday. You know, my, my, my in my personality type, mm -hmm. I am actually an introvert. In fact, people, I, I, I always tell people, they don't believe what I say. They say, no, what are you talking about? It's the, it's the Holy Ghost that, mm -hmm. the fire of the Holy Spirit that, that, that just revolutionized that part. Yeah. So when I am by myself, that part shows up. So if you want to know me, you have to ask my wife, my kids, my mm -hmm. children. I don't say kids, because kids means children of, anyway. <laughs> my children, you know, yes. my seed. Mm -hmm. you know, those are the scriptural words for children, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, uh, that's how I was. But when I got the fire of the Holy Spirit, everything changed. I mean, my personality changed. I remember mm -hmm. my dad, because when, when I got the baptism, I took my Bible and ran to the streets. I felt this strong urge to just, you know, Tell everybody about Jesus. So I went to the street, my Bible. I still remember the place was flooded with water. Mm -hmm. So I walked into that water, raised my Bible mm -hmm. with the water covering just my belt side. Yeah. And I was screaming, <laughs> repent and be baptized or you will go so to hell I, I have and a not question. be saved. Yes, sir. <laughs> At 1989, you're 14, right? Yes. When that happens, you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So was your knowledge of God's word best of you watching TV or you had been studious, even you being raised as a Catholic, were you studying God's word? Um, <laughs> that is a very good question. Yeah. I, I don't even know how to answer you, but th that question I would say is because I've been exposed now to teachings from the church. Mm -hmm. I've been exposed to reading my Bible and all that. But I would not say that I went to preach because I felt I'd learned something. Mm -hmm. I just felt a need to share ah, the gospel with everybody. It was okay. not based on what somebody taught me. Mm -hmm. It was based on the fact that I wanted everybody to know what has happened to me yeah. and what can happen to them. Okay. Um, and that is a very good question because in today's world, everybody's making noise. Oh, you have to be trained or you have to be yeah. equipped. You have to be... 
we have more information now and the church is less impactful. <laughs> That's another subject for another day. Yeah. <laughs> that time we didn't have much. I yeah. mean, all we had was our relationship with God and the Bible. Yeah. And the, I, I, I like to always say that my Christian journey cost me my relationship with my dad. Yeah, because I wanted to come you know, on that. I mean, everybody gets born again and oh, it's smooth. The only, maybe the only, the, only, the only challenge you face is maybe oh, they just, uh, maybe the demons are worrying me. Mine mm -hmm. was combined yeah. with physical persecution and injury for the sake of Christ. I always yeah. say that when I get to heaven, when Jesus is showing me his scars, I will show him my scars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that that's the basis of my salvation, but you see, yeah. um, um, my, 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 my decision to follow Jesus mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> was very expensive, sir. So how was the journey? Because I, I do <laughs> understand when you are raised up in a space at 14, number one, you have no say. You're still under the Dependent, covering of your yes. parents. And if you decide to say, hey, hmm. I want to go this approach and looking at the fact that you, quote unquote, Pente Pentecostal now, you're running away from the traditional church, the Catholic church, the sacraments, the vo different vocations and all. Hmm. How was that received? Uh, it was not received very well. I, I must let you know that my dad is my hero. My dad is somebody that I looked up to. My dad was everything to mm -hmm. me, as it were, you know. And when I, I, I never expected that, you know, um, giving my life to Jesus was going to make him that angry. In fact, the first time I saw him, you know, when he heard that I was now going to church, I was like, you know, because... Okay, my parents were separated and mm -hmm. my dad lived in another house and he's, 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 you know, so he got, he was, somebody reported to him that, oh no. So he came charging at home. Mm -hmm. what is it, what is it? You know, so, so I was struck to see, oh, you know, because my dad is the guy who would take the priest to church and back. It was like the protocol guy, yes. drive to church, bring mm -hmm. him and, you know, stuff. So our house, we're used to hosting men of God and stuff. Yes. So I was very surprised to see mm -hmm. his reaction. You know, so it that's the first thing that that really struck me, you know, um, but it was not received very well. So everybody was worried. I, I looking back now, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the reasons why, why I'm passionate about the church, um, that Christianity should not be related to poverty. True. Yes, because some of the words my dad used to say was, now you've joined these people, you are destroying your future. Yes. These guys are going nowhere. Yes. Half of the people you are you are interacting with are people who are nobodies. Struggling. Struggling, and, you know. So yeah. now you have decided to destroy your potential future mm -hmm. because you want to be hanging around guys who are going nowhere. So those were the words he was using. Now going, now he and I are friends. I mean, I'm much older and we had conversations and one of the things he said to me mm -hmm. was that 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 issue was out of the fact that he felt that yeah. I wanted to actually destroy my future because I was hanging around people who were going nowhere. Yeah, because that was the message they preached. Ah, no, nothing on earth was necessary. All you need is to go to heaven. You understand? Yeah. Yes, people have called me pro prosperity preachers, but I like you to know that 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 statement, you know, that you are making against the message of prosperity, it my it made my Christianity my Christian journey as a teenager difficult. Yes, because my dad thought that Christians are poor people. In fact, Pentecostals are poor, poor. people. They are not going to go anywhere. <laughs> When you give your life to Christ, if I still remember doing evangelism at with the group at church, my dad, my, my dad drove this car and saw us standing by the street sharing tracks. He came out of the car very angry. I've told you this boy, you are embarrassing me. Eh? You are the child of a king and you are this, this and mm -hmm. that. You can't be standing with refrains like mm -hmm. this. Get into the car. So my dad drags me into the car, pushes me into the car and locks yeah. the door and drives off. Another time I'm at church leading praise and worship. My dad walks in very angry, runs straight to the altar, grabs me with the mic and pulls me out. People are begging, said, no, my child can't be with any people. We call, Nigeria, we call it NFAs, no future ambition. Yeah. <laughs> people are going nowhere, you yeah. know? Very furious. Mm -hmm. So after his um, attempts to scare me, after several um, um, beatings and all that, mm -hmm. when he saw that my, I was very resilient, so he said, okay, now that you have decided to, to to follow these people and follow the, their ways yes. and follow the ways of Christ through their ways. You are not going to be my child anymore. You are now on your own. Since you have decided not to listen and how to how old were you? I was 14. Yes. So you are now on your own. So don't ever call me for anything. And that was my grade nine. After I had paid for the exams, 
that was the encounter. So I say my, my relationship with God cost me everything. So now I had no father again to go to. So I stopped going to my dad for anything I wanted from that age. So where did you move to now? I was now staying with my mom. So my mom came and took me and then I started staying with her. So your mom accepted the call? Uh, not your... necessarily, but you know mothers and their children at the end of the day. <laughs> it's my son. Yeah, I mean, it's my son. So yeah. she, she kept discouraging me. She kept, I said, no, mom, this is it. You don't know where this journey will, will take me to. Me, I found Christ. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it led me into a lot of things. I had to now live on the streets. I had to now start fending for myself. I can't tell you how many times I've slept in the car, in the mechanic garage. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many times I've... Wow. <laughs> the Christian journey. For me, my, my, it's like somebody once said, that Satan just realized that, man, this guy is going to terrorize us. Let's threaten him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> threaten him and do all sorts of things yeah. to him so that, you know, some of the things that my dad did to me and the things that happened, I can't say because we are in the air, okay. out of respect for him. But like I said before, um, when Jesus shows me his cards, I yeah. will show him mine. Yes. So that can tell you a lot. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Hmm. But that today, they are my dad, I mean, my dad is born again. My, my mom is born again. They're giving their life to Christ and... Um, it's interesting that my dad would call me and say, Pastor, please pray for us. <laughs> it feels like the blind Bartimaeus. Thank you. Yes, yes. So that's why I'm very, very passionate mm -hmm. that you cannot relate Christianity with poverty. Okay. You cannot tell the young people to just focus on heaven and be irrelevant on the earth. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe in the doctrine of materialism. I believe that doctrine is not scriptural. Yeah. Yes. I believe a Christian... The, 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 apart from his character transformation, another evidence of his work with God is the increase of his substance. Job okay. chapter 1 is clear. Yes. I mean, the Bible gives his, his resume. Oh, he's yes. a righteous man, yes. etc., etc., etc. Mm -hmm. He has children. He has, uh, <laughs> by the time they were reaching the, the verse 6, it says he, verse 4, 5, and 6 of Job chapter 1, it says his substance in the land increased greatly. Yes. Then when Satan was confessing, about what was limiting him from affecting Job. He said, you have blessed the work of his hand. You put a edge around him. Yes. And Satan quoted the same thing. He was the one saying his substance in the land has increased. Yeah. So righteousness is not just about having a personal relationship with God that mm -hmm. just making you achieve a certain religious undertone. It's also going to be expressed in your lifestyle. Yes. The result will start showing. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> As you've rightly put it. Uh, yes. You, at grade nine, you leave your father's house. house. When reading your bio, mm. you have extensively studied <laughs> and still studying, I guess. <laughs> wow. Uh, why did you go in the approach of studying a lot? Part, part of the reason is what I've just explained to you now. Yes. You know? Because my father's assumption was that once you become born again, you are going to be an illiterate, mm -hmm. you drop out from school, yes. you're not going to go anywhere, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, live your life, leave me alone, yeah. you know? So part is part of it, you know, that there's need for Christians to be highly educated people, mm -hmm. you know? You, we can't, we can't, I always say it, uh, um, um, people always, a lot of, a, a, a quarter of Christianity thinks that education is not important. Mm. Now, my, my, my disposition to that is, you know, can you use a blunt knife? Because mm -hmm. what education does, it just sharpens a knife. Yes. When a knife is sharp, it can, it can do the work effectively. Mm -hmm. So when a knife is blunt, that thing that you should have cut in one minute, you, will be, you can spend three hours, four hours yeah. trying to do it. I mean, we are seated having an interview now. You can tell from my conversation that I'm a very articulate person. Definitely. It's not just because that, oh, the guy just woke up yesterday. No. <laughs> no. But every time I'm opening my mouth, you see the, the, the construction of my sentences and my diction and how I'm presenting myself shows that I have some kind of training yes. in thinking. Mm -hmm. You understand? And that's what education does, does to any person. It can, it, and it's, 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 I always call it an equalizer. It doesn't have respect for your background, where mm -hmm. you're coming from, whether you're rich or poor. It seems to have a way to equalize the population, which is why I believe strongly everyone must have access to it, you know? So that's why the first one. The second reason mm -hmm. is the issue of being relevant, yeah. earthly. You see, 
Um, ask yourself this question. Apostle Peter was a fisherman. Mm -hmm. Paul was a, doc, was a doctor of philosophy in law yes. and was an artisan. You understand? The fisherman, when he was going to write portions of the scriptures, only wrote two books. <laughs> but check out the man who was educated. How many books of the Bible he wrote? He wrote. You and understand? how he wrote Good. as well. So. Okay, let's talk about Moses and Joshua. Because mm -hmm. you see, Moses was highly educated because he was part of the Egyptian, Egyptian system. system yes. You understand? He was trained in the Egyptian system for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Look at the, how that man wrote the first and most important books, books. of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You understand? Compare that to Joshua, who only wrote one book. You understand? Mm -hmm. And see the, the systems and processes with which Moses articulated his revelation. So certain encounters Moses had, Joshua did not have it. Yeah. So I always say, your level of knowledge determines the, the level of encounters you can have with God. That's mm -hmm. why I think it's First Peter 5. First Peter 1, he talks about the fact that, is it Second Peter 1, 5, that to your, to your, to your knowledge, to your, to your faith, add mm -hmm. virtue, to your virtue, add knowledge. Yeah. Because there are certain things that if you don't know, God can give you. If you don't have an understanding of it, you can't get it. That's why Proverbs 4, 7 says, get understanding. You know, wisdom is the principal thing. And then yeah. Galatians 4, 1 and 2 talks about the fact that if a person does not have knowledge or is like a child, he will not be different from a slave because they will not be able to give him treasures, mm -hmm. things that are important because his mentality is like that of a slave. So the day he graduates from his, a, a child to become a son, then they can give him inheritance. Mm -hmm. I believe one of the reasons why the body of Christ today is poor is a lack of information. Education plays an important role in that area. Because when, when the mind is educated, when the mind is transformed, which mm -hmm. is why that Romans chapter 12 talks about transformation, verse yeah. 2. It's a key word. First thing, oh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then yes. two, say, be not be conformed to this world, but, but be renewed but the, by the transformation of, of the mind. mind. So you see, the more the mind is transformed, then you'll be able to judge what is good, and acceptable, what? and perfect will of God. So mm -hmm. more transformation, more resources. More transformation, more influence and dominion. Mm -hmm. Less transformation, less influence and dominion. You know, so the, the, the lack that you see in the body of Christ today is just simply because a lot of us as Christians are not educated people, you know. And when I say educated, I'm not talking about just gathering papers and putting things. The capacity to be able to reason, mm -hmm. you understand? One has to be trained to reason, yep. you understand? That training is what education is. So that when you get an information, like me now, my, my PhD is in, in religious studies. That means... <laughs> If I tell you the scripts I've read of all <laughs> kinds of religions, you'll be amazed. Yeah. You know? And the, the area of my thesis, the way I concentrated on, is how Christianity can, faith can be relevant to a modern day era. Yep. I call this socioeconomic evangelism. How evangelism should not just be about talking to people. That a pastor of a, a, of a church is also like the president of a country. Mm -hmm. So if I pastor, for example, Mutendere, I should not just be thinking about how many members I can gather together yes. in my church. I should think... Hmm. How many schools are in Mutendere? What are the roads? What are the states of the roads in Mutendere? Mm -hmm. Do my people have um, um, water. water to drink, yes. health care? Mm -hmm. What type of, uh, um, what are the infant mortality rates? Yes. How, how many pregnant women have access to, mm -hmm. you know, gynecological services? All that. So when I'm thinking, how many of the youths have jobs? When I'm the, because I am the pastor. God has sent me to that town. Not just to just raise Numbers. Numbers. So, yeah. But to actually be a light and transform that community. So that whole community is my responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know? So what has happened over the church, over the in the church over the years is that you get there as a pastor in Mutendere. You don't care where your people go to after church. Yeah. Whether yeah. they are going to sleep in the streets. As long as they show up on Sunday, you can take the attendance and brag on social media. Oh, I have 10,000 members. Mm -hmm. I have 1,000 members. You, you have done your job. That's not true. Jesus also cared about what the people ate, mm -hmm. where they sat, where they slept the roads that they used to yep. go to where they were going to. If you think I don't believe me, read Matthew 25. I mean, it was saying that you didn't visit hospitals, you didn't go to prison, you didn't feed me when I was on, you didn't clothe me. People ask, ah, sir, when did we see you? He said, you didn't do it to these people. You didn't do it to, mm -hmm. to me. And because of that, mm -hmm. a lot of people were called goats and they were sent to hell. It's there in Matthew 25. You know, so churches must not just be thinking about attenders. We must think holistically because man yeah. is a tripartite being. Man is a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. So our salvation must meet the three. Mm -hmm. 
Because if you if you just identify the, the need of the spiritual man and you forget the soul, that means you don't educate that person. You forget the body. You, you put him in an environment where he's sickly, he can't pay his school fees for his children, mm -hmm. he has no employment opportunities. The things that led him to sin in the first place will affect now his relationship with God. He is going to go back to the world because somebody will bring an opportunity for him to lie. He's going to sign that contract and lie and cheat and go. Why? Because his needs are not being met. Yeah. So as a pastor, that's me, and that's that's why I said um, 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 some kind of training is required to think the way I'm thinking. Yes. You cannot just think about taking people to heaven. That is not just... And it's interesting. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but God wants to come here. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> because when Jesus prayed, he didn't say, hey, uh, our Father which has in teaches us, when he was teaching us to pray, he said, our yeah. Father which has in heaven, I will be thy name, your kingdom come. He says, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He didn't say, Father, help us to take everybody to heaven. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants to come here. In fact, there's a time written in scripture where he's coming here to come and establish a government for 1,000 years. You know, anyway, everybody has their own position. But for me, that's my position. I yeah. must think roads, houses, educational systems. I must think about water. I must think about development, creating jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of those people who believe that when you build a 10,000 seater, you must also build factories. Yes. yes, to create jobs. We have to be doing it side by side. We can't just be gathering to build calisiums and Because a lot of those churches that were built in Europe years ago, today are nightclubs. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them have been turned to dance places and stuff. You know, So the church must not isolate itself from the, from the things that affect people. Mm -hmm. Because our life is about people. You know? So th those are the, the, my position about education. And that's the reason why um, I, I'm passionate. I'm still a student myself. I'm still... Although I've rested a bit last year and this year, uh, but next year, by God's grace, I'm pushing for another set of papers again. I mean, writing more papers to get recommended to be Now we have to go into artificial intelligence and a lot of robotics and all those things. We need to start reading it now. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the day, we have to stay relevant. So, as we said earlier, you say that at 25, you moved to Zambia as a missionary. 1999, exactly. So, coming back, when you became born again, Pentecostal, did you now join the redeemed Christian Church of God? No, no, no. Or? Actually, the church where I got born again is called Gospel Believers Mission. Okay. Under my pastor then, his name is Pastor Jude Uke. Mm -hmm. um, those are the people that, that um, what's the word, um, created my desire for yes. a personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who taught us about revival and all yep. those things. You know, that's the church where I got baptized um and stuff so those are that's that's my journey so after some years mm -hmm. because where i was living the government declared it as an area that was not gazette, gazetted they asked us to leave mm -hmm. so we had to move and the government demolished that area yep. so i had no opportunity to interact with that church anymore um so, so when i was going back and forth then god spoke to me that he was sending me to an anglican church okay um and that, okay, what he didn't say, Anglican, he said, I'm sending you to a church where you're going to be part of the revival, the transformation of the church in the land. So I went to talk to my pastor, the assistant, and he prayed for me and released me. Mm -hmm. You know, so just a few months after that, a friend of mine who lives in the same area where I live asked me, I've seen that you have some time to try and visit our church. When I walked into the church, it's an Anglican church, and um, I sensed in my spirit that God said, This is the place where mm -hmm. you're supposed to be. So I was there for five years. Okay. Um, and it was during that time that I had an encounter with the redeemed Christian Church of God. So I used to go, 1994, I used to go for uh, what they call digging deep, mm -hmm. you know, those days on Tuesdays. You know, I would attend, and then on Sunday I go to the Anglican Church, then, you know, just like that. And for several years like that, until I finally decided to move to the redeemed Christian Church of God and join a church called, the par a parish then, in a place called Obanikoro, uh, called Lighthouse um, Parish. Mm -hmm. And... That was a church that was pastored by the man, the pastor I, that brought me to Zambia. His name is Pastor Jolomi Benebiche. He's the one that was sent here. And then, if I remember him showing up, 1990, I, I've just joined this church. And even how I joined was very was very uh, dramatic because I walked in because I had my own ministry and mm -hmm. I had to basically a worship and um, evangelistic ministry called Preacher and the Family. Mm -hmm. So I had the, his bass guitarist was my member. And those days we had no phones, all these things. Those days, if you have to get, you have to go and get, you know, landline like this one, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had needed to go and speak to him directly to let him know that we have a crusade out yeah. of town in a place called Quara State. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I when I walked into the car park, I just heard God clearly, that man preaching. You have to follow him. Yep. 
in your following him is where you're going to find your destiny and your future. Whatever I asked you to do, make sure you do it. So I'm still thinking, quiet, standing by the car park, listening to that voice speak like that. Then mm -hmm. I see his choir director. She walks in with a mic. Yes, say, uh, my first time, mm -hmm. first Sunday. Mm -hmm. Said, no, my pastor said I should give you the mic. <laughs> that you are the one leading praise and worship today. <laughs> my very first Sunday. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I went in, led praise and worship. The atmosphere opened up and he just started, you know, you need to join me. You need to join me. I said, ah. I'm see, I'm see, I'm see. To cut a long story short, I ended up joining that parish. That's where I was. So that was our pastor. So he was transferred from Nigeria, Lagos to Zambia in 1998. He asked me to come 98, but ah, I was refusing. In fact, 1998 was when first July was the first time he said, Osage, your assignment in Nigeria is over. Mm -hmm. God has sent you to Zambia. Zam what? The only thing I remember about Zambia is Kenneth Kaunda and Kalusha Walia because yeah. of soccer and of course the issues of politics. Was. The yes. 1994. Yeah, 1994. Finals. And then, of course, with Kenneth Kaunda being our hero in Pan Africanism yes. and all that. And me, me, I'm passionate about Africa. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I refused. Said, ah, no, sir. Ah, me, I can't. Yeah, 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 I need to go and pray about it. So he said, okay, you take your time. Go and pray about it. So I, I, I moved away from home, mm -hmm. went to stay in a solitary place, prayed for almost a year, you know. And then it was in that, in that place that God spoke to me, April. 99. Mm -hmm. Now you need to go back home because um, I've given you permission to go to Zambia. Yeah. You are not going to be seeing your mother for some time. Mm -hmm. So you need to go and spend some time with her. You know, so I went back home April 99. Then May, I called Pastor Jolomi here. I said, okay, look, I'm ready to come to Zambia. He said, okay, then made the arrangements. Then July 3rd, 2nd, I jumped on a plane in Nigeria and I've not looked back ever since, you know. And uh, July 3rd, 1999, exactly. I touched down Zambia for the very first time. Mm -hmm. KK International Airport. You know, th those days was called Lusaka International. International. Yeah, International Airport, you yes. know, so, and uh, entered Gracie Road for the first time. Somebody once asked me, what is the evidence to show that you have lived in Zambia for so long? I said, when I came, Gracie Road was two lanes. You are going and you are coming back. Yeah. <laughs> that should tell you how long I've been here. <laughs> you know, so, and that's the journey. And we've walked in. All the provinces in this country, except Northern Province, that, the part, Kasama, that, I think that's the way to say it properly, you know. And um, it has been a wonderful experience. 25 years, I've literally grown up here, married here, have children here. I settled here permanently, you know. And the, the rest so they say is history. So you're a re resident, or you switch nationalities as well? Uh, just say I'm a Zambarian. <laughs> Put it like that. <laughs> yeah. That's the, I'm a combination of Zambia okay. and Nigeria. So that's yes. why the RCCG arena is called Lighthouse. Yes. Of, that was when, mentioned. yes, that was when the name was changed by them because the church had sent Pastor Jolomi Benevich at that time. Okay. And when I arrived, that was the name they had called it Lighthouse Arenas at that time. Okay. Yeah. And that was the church where I started from. Kalingalinga was, Kamloops was the first road I was busy and I was living in Lemonwood in Chelston. Yeah. It's a long story. You know, and that journey has taken me around this country and everywhere. Yeah. By the grace of God. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about family. So hmm. did you meet your wife here or you went back to Nigeria? And Wow. That's a very important story. You know, um, February 1990, February 2000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. February 2000. Pastor Jolomi had started a new branch of the redeemed church called Jesus House Parish. Mm -hmm. And he had asked us to follow him and we had gone with him. To yeah. begin that parish, you know. Um, then my wife invited this, my, my the pastor Jeremy invited this group to minister at church. Yeah. They were a group of young girls who used to sing powerfully, although all of them are married, <laughs> they're America, everything has, yeah. you know. Um, and they were called they were called Destiny. They were pastored by Tivo Shikapwasha, you know. Uh, he was the he was the manager of this group, you know. So okay. Tivo was spoken to by my pastor to invite a group to come and minister at church, mm -hmm. and that's where my wife showed up you know for, for me that's the first time i was meeting her you know although she gives a different story and i'm shocked <laughs> you know she gives a different story and um, um that's the first time i met her so when she was she, when the group came and was ministering i just heard the holy spirit say clearly that one that girl which one that, that one that one that's your wife yeah i just come out of a, a, a relationship that did not work out with another zambian lady um i guess god did not want that to happen you know but then I just heard God say, that one, that's your wife. I said, yeah. Zambian, ah, no. With that, what has happened with me with this one, I'm not going to marry Zambian again. You know, but then I heard the whole, clearly so, yeah. you know. 
Um, he just said to me, you can't use one person's mistake to judge all the women in the country. True. Learn to keep people's mistakes attached to them. It's like saying all oh, men are... Oh, hey, hey, men are... Hey, 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 <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the way you and I are talking, you can tell from the way I'm talking that the relationship with the Holy Spirit is a major part of my decision-making yes. skills. Yes. yes. You know, and I thank God. I'm... I'm I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have that access. You know, from the time I go, maybe it's because of how I was treated by my dad. Holy Spirit now became my counselor. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, will be talking to me that you, the way you and I are talking. Yeah. That's why I, I don't relate with God as a person I have to serve. It's, I don't see it like that. It's, it's, I can't relate with that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe because I'm a special child. Like I tell my children, I'm God's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you can dispute it. Well, no problem. You know? Yeah. So that's how he said, no, that's your wife, you know. Um, so, I, so I resisted a bit. He gave me that information. So, ah. Then I started now watching, you know. Then I noticed that her character and her passion for God was just unique. Mm -hmm. She was just a, 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 a person who loves God and is passionate about what she believes. Yeah. And she seemed to have the type of, you know, characteristics of a wife that I wanted, mm -hmm. you know. Basically, somebody who is consistent, yeah. who doesn't allow circumstances or conditions of um, uh, present issues affect her position mm -hmm. um, and decision that she has made. Yep. You understand? Because many people, they're, they're like the pendulum. One minute they are hot, yes. and minute they are mm -hmm. cold, you know? And that began to give me more confidence. And that was what, that's what led me to how I spoke to her. My wife is Lunda and Lozi. Her dad is Lunda. Her mom is Lozi. And it's interesting that after I stayed in Lusaka for, just after we married, we married in 2002, you know, I came in 99. By 2002, I was married. And mm -hmm. then um, 2003, the church now gave me a letter in September and transferred me to my wife's village in Mongo. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, the, I said, what, what Jesus yeah. said is true. The, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. There will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was sent back to my wife's people. And it's interesting how when we reported at church, and the church was quite small. You know, less than five families, 23 yeah. people, and we just embraced them and began to run. Don't need to find that as people began to join the church, our relatives also joined. And yeah. we did not know about it until years later. You know, when we began to see, meet them in family meetings, ah, you are, yes, that's your uncle of your sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and it has been a wonderful journey. I, I pastored in Mongo for five years and... I don't so know. You speak a little bit of some Lozi as well. Uh, yeah, Lozi was the very first lang mm -hmm. Zambian language I could ac articulate with. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, because you you had to you had to preach, you had yeah. to speak to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they were becoming uh, you know, you start, you begin to now start cracking your brain. What did this person just say? Uh -huh. Then the Holy Spirit interprets. And then because they've repeated it constantly, you remember, oh, mitapelo means prayer. Oh, womuluti means teacher. Oh. Okay, Nibata means I want, you know, mm -hmm. so you start connecting the dot, yeah. dots and then with the, the, you know, the help of the gift of tongues with yeah. the Holy Spirit gives. Now you start now getting a bigger view mm -hmm. and then sometimes you even correct the interpreter. You know, no, that's not what I said. That's what, <laughs> yeah. what I mean. And yeah. that's, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> Loses, I remember one funny incident that happened at the airport. My wife and I were traveling to Nigeria and the immigration officer saw me and said, Ewe, phone a passport. So I said, ah. I gave him the Nigerian passport. I said, ah, ew, I'm full of Zambian passport. I said, Zambian, I'm not a Zambian. He said, no, you are a Zambian. Give me your Zambian passport. <laughs> then I said, my wife is a Zambian. He said, no, she's a Nigerian. Let her ah. <laughs> Very funny incident. So he thought we were joking <laughs> and we were lying. So he turns to my wife. You know, I know Lozi is not spoken in Lusaka. Mm -hmm. So he goes and speaks Lozi, thinking that if he speaks Lozi, if she was a foreigner, she would not be able to speak Lozi. Mm -hmm. Then he greets my wife. <laughs> my wife even begins to... Ask him how the children are and begins to. The man is, is shocked. He's just shocked as he's stamping our passports. He's even shaking. Say, you can go, you can go, you can go. Yeah. You know, because um, that's what marriage does. Uh, I have been Zambianized and she's been Nigerianized. You know? Oh, so, sure. we, so when you get to our home, you can't find a Zambian or a Nigerian. You yeah. just find a man and his wife and the children. Oh, so, so we spoke on your wife. Now, as we read, you have five children. Correct. The walk us through now the journey of parenting. <laughs> and the reasons why I'm asking this is, look, you leave Nigeria. The time you left, you didn't have a strong relationship with your parents. You are coming from a broken 
home? Mm. How was now that journey? And thinking through, you're a Christian leader. Mm. A lot of people are looking up to you. Mm. And there's a pressure of raising children mm. in God's way. Mm. Okay. Um, the first thing I'd like to say, since you have brought up that issue, is that um, we... What's the word? A lot of people like to look for a lot of excuses why things fail. Mm -hmm. You know? And one of the things they try to do is to attribute failure in that sense of marriage because the person came from a broken home. Yes. That's, it, that's... It's not true. Mm -hmm. There are people who lived in... In fact, experienced the, the greatest abuse that they can ever have in a house. Mm -hmm. But they've ended up as wonderful parents. That is the reason why I always say you are not your event, neither are you your circumstance. You know, you are the one who has to make a choice about how something affects you. For example, you don't have power or control over things that are, um, uh, what's the word, external from you. Mm -hmm. You understand? You can't, you can't determine how people treat you, yeah. but you can determine how you react to it. You understand? So you can't determine how, which circumstance, or, or else all of us will choose to be born in homes that are perfect. Everybody will be, choose, what, what will it be doing in Africa? Mm -hmm. We'll be in Europe or somewhere. You know, but that's the family I arrived in, and um, and that is the the setup. I I will not say that my 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 parents were divorced because my mom never divorced my dad, just that my dad married another woman, so it's like the house has two wives. <laughs> you understand? So my mom never. She would, in fact, somebody once asked her, divorce. She said, No, no, no. Me, I made a vow to stay with him forever and ever, and that's what I'm going to do. So they were married in church. In church, yes. And then... Then my, my dad married a second wife. Okay. Yes. Okay. So they were not divorced. And the home is, is intact. But just that my dad was not staying with my mom. That's the, that's the um, clarity in that area. So it's pretty so, much a polygamous home. A polygamous home, yeah. So the, 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 why I dealt with that and give that information is because I, I am a true believer... Um, in the fact that you make your life what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't say, oh, because you come from polygamous home, um, your parents were divorced, or you, 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 in fact, if we go that way, that means every person whose father was poor should be poor. <laughs> yeah. Every person whose father was not educated should not be educated. Mm -hmm. But for, for some reason, we want to give everybody excuses not to pay the price that is required for them to live a successful life. You know, and I'm not one of those people who believe in that. I believe you are personally responsible for what you do. And go, going like that way, I can now even add to the fact that because of now this relationship with Christ that one has, mm -hmm. my heritage now is not that lifestyle that my dad and mom lived. My heritage is that of Christ. Yeah. So I lean towards my lineage mm -hmm. with Christ. That is more important to me than the lineage I found. And that's how I even got married. That was what I was looking for. And the kind of person to settle down with, the kind of person to marry, mm -hmm. the kind of person to live with. You understand? Somebody who was not just a believer in talk, real lifestyle, you know? And that, that, that governed the, kind, the choice of the kind of person I married, actually. So that that way, when we live in a, Christ, when we live in a home, mm -hmm. I'm not going to have a woman who will be, will be having a different philosophy from mine. You understand? And those were the things I was very conscious about. Yeah. You understand? Um, and that's how we've been, been leading our homes, based on the Bible. Because I am a Nigerian, she's a Zambian, and then we are living together in the house. How then do we raise our children? Zambian mm -hmm. culture or Nigerian culture? You understand? We raise the children based on the Bible culture. Yeah. You understand? And the way we live our lives, we live our life with the consciousness that we are training the next generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first, my first child is 21 years old. She just finished from the University of Zambia. She's born again, love Jesus. You've never heard her one day, anybody say, oh, she was found in one nightclub or she's somewhere partying somewhere. Mm -hmm. Her own party is, oh, there's a worship connection. She's gone. Oh, no, there's a whatever. She's there. That's the kind of lifestyle she lives. The second one is 18 and just graduated from DK. I mean, that's a school that I don't want to mention some names. He graduated from that school nicely and is now doing computer science in Zika's. You understand? Yeah. The number three is actually in grade 12. And she's the pastor of a church, you know, in school already. Okay. That tells you a lot. Yeah. The number four is also a person who has a bias towards Christianity. And the number four is already, um, I mean, as a baby, used to ask us to switch on the music. Uh, no weapon formed against me. The child is singing even mm -hmm. as a baby, you know. So 
what you must know about raising children mm -hmm. is that your child is going to be like you. An apple does not fall far from the tree. Okay. I repeat that again. Mm -hmm. The key to parenting is example. So in my house, I tell my children, you can't go where you can't defend. You can't say what you have not researched. Yep. You can't stand where it's against your belief. Mm -hmm. And you can't do what you have not seen me do. You know? So if I don't take alcohol, where are you getting it from? Yep. So if I don't take drugs, where are you getting it from? You've seen me how I operate. Everything I do is straightforward. So copy my lifestyle because yep. me, I'm following Christ. And as I tell my children all the time, we mm -hmm. are a, a family that has a relationship with God. And me as the head of the house, as a patriarch, I'm the example and the one that is going to lay the foundation yep. for how the family will be like. And that's how it has been. You know, so, for example, I've been here 25 years. I'm not going to hear oh, Osage has a girlfriend somewhere. Oh, even a lie. Mm -hmm. hey, guy, hey, like, hey. <laughs> Maybe now that I've said it, somebody will go and cook it up. Uh, but, I mean, I've been here 25 years. I've seen all kinds of scandals, ministries I've had, but I've not. I mean, you should you should hear. Mm -hmm. I am at the place where what I do will not be hidden. Yeah. You understand? But you've not heard anything. Yeah. 25 years is a long time. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's because there's a certain level of discipline that one has, and a certain level of discipline we are inculcating in the children. Mm -hmm. And we have that platform to say that because we are living the life. Yeah. Why a lot of Christian families fail in their parenting is because their profession and their lifestyle are in conflict. And young people don't learn by what you say. They learn by what you do. You can't find a bottle of whiskey in my house. It's not possible. You can't find any alcohol in my home. You can't find it. You know? And you can't find any of my children in one or somewhere. No. Because even at 21, I still say, oh, where are you going? No, I'm going to... What time are you coming back? I'm coming at 19 hours. What did you say? 19 hours. 19 hours I'm calling. Where are you? This is the time you say you are coming. No, why did you come? They come and report. You understand me? Mm -hmm. The Bible says a person who cannot rule his house he doesn't have permission to rule anyway. the church of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? So there's discipline in the home. And the other, the other issue is that a lot of born-again Christians are trying to modernize their families. What I mean by modernize their families is that uh, I had, I had, a, I had a, a, a training some, a few weeks ago, and I asked the youths that were there, what is the definition of love? How do you define somebody that loves you? Oh, no, he cares for me. You no, know, He takes care of me. He believes in me, supports me. I said, are you guys sure you are born again? They said, yes. Uh, why then did you, didn't you talk about chastisement? Eh, hey, but it's quiet. Yeah, real love. Real love. It's a person who looks at you and tells you what is wrong with you. Mm -hmm. But our generation, the young people say, you are judging me. It's yes. not judging you. They are helping you. For yeah. example, you go to the, somebody goes to the hospital. They have malaria. The doctor doesn't take a sweet tablet to give you. He gives you something bitter. Yeah. Children are fighting, but that bitter thing is going to save the life of a child. Our young people today are not ready to take the truth. I mean, this guy is not good for you. No, I'm going to marry him, whatever what happens. I'll change him. I'll change him. I feel like, I feel like. You understand? You understand? Yeah. You find we even choose churches that way. Churches that don't tell you the truth, you go there, oh, wow, they're making us feel good. Don't fall away, you know, everybody's happy, you know. <laughs> you understand? But you should go to a place where somebody say, eh, wait, 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 wait. stop it, you'll die like that. Uh -huh. Those people are helping you. So, um, I don't run away from the fact that I need to confront issues with my children from mm -hmm. time to time. It doesn't mean I hate them. Actually, that is my best expression of love to my children. Yeah. So when a child brings a toy home, I ask, ah, where did you get the toy from? I didn't buy you something. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, no, it's my friend. Since you didn't tell me, take that toy back to that person. You understand? Those are things like that. I don't allow my children to interact with anybody anyhow. Mm -hmm. I even determine who you go and meet. I even know where you are going. Because you see, the most important assignment for a parent is not actually care. It's actually preparing that child for the future. Because there's a time coming where I will not be able to help them again. Yep. I will be able to give them life skills. And, you know, that, and once I've given them a relationship with God and the mm -hmm. education, the next is the life skill and attitude. Okay. So, Psalm 21. Yes. Psalm 23. Yes. Um, 
the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. He leads me besides the still waters Correct. for your rod and your staff uh-huh. guide me. And there's an aspect. He didn't say guide you, he said comfort me. Comfort uh-huh. me. Uh-huh. Rod and staff. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Comfort. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's an aspect, I think it's in Proverbs where you say spoil the rod, spoil the child. So yes. meaning that the father is a shepherd in that he gets to guide and gets to discipline. You know, yes. the, Discipline means to in, inflict a certain level of restriction. Yes. Um, it's not to abuse the child. It's to in, inflict certain level of restriction, yeah. you know, um, because you are trying to help the child to be able to conquer a certain attitude. Yeah. And what we are dealing with now in our current generation is in discipline. Okay. Yes, Coming sir. to that now, I, I brought about those two scriptures, and you mentioned it that now the Christian space is more liberal thank you a lot of people uh, uh, more liberal i think I'll, I'll 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 call it a, a neoliberal approach we are trying to be modernized and yes you know trying to walk into what i call the pop culture christianity yes so a lot of that is happening there's uh it's now part of lifestyle to belong to a church or a movement. So long as we're able to pray and post prayers on our WhatsApp statuses and Facebook, then we are good. <laughs> so you, looking at you who is passionate about young people raising revivalists, what's the approach now? And Men- Mentorship. Yes. And quoting you, you say, I think what I'm trying to remember, you said that, the church has more, yes, well-read people, but less impactful. We're trying to bring about all these modern approaches, but yet being less impactful. Because the, the Christianity was not designed to just be about talk. Yeah. It was lifestyle. It, in fact, that word, Christian, mm-hmm. like Jesus, that's how it means. It means lifestyle. It's not oh, how they are talking. It's how they live. Yeah. So they looked at the way they were doing certain things and said, oh, these are like mm-hmm. Jesus. Christ. You yes. understand? So we've reduced Christianity to just, um, I call it acting, mm-hmm. performance, stage. You know, everything's about the stage, yeah. you know, the men of God on stage, all of... So a Christian, everybody's on stage, we're all acting. You understand? But the real part of Christianity, which is why Apostle Paul's writings and the teachings of the New Testament are more about interpersonal relationships. Yeah. In fact, Apostle Paul goes to the next level to say... If we compare your giftings, anointings, mm-hmm. the encounters you have with God, with personal relationship, mm-hmm. the, the size of a Christian will be measured by how they love other people and okay. how they treat people. How Those are the things we should be looking out for. Not mm-hmm. how many souls they've won, how many um, a creep who has walked, blind, see, deaf, here. Apostle Paul put it like, he said, do I have faith that can move mountains? I don't have love. It is total rubbish. Mm-hmm. According to him, it's not yes. me who said it all. Uh-huh. It's him who say, says, no, don't profit me anything. Mm-hmm. If I can see angels and I ha- understand the tongues of angels and I, and I understand the tongues of men and I have no love, it's nothing. It's nothing. If, I, if I even give my body to be born and I give everything I have to the poor, do all this, if I have no love, then he starts mentioning love is patient, love is kind, love is you know, yeah. temperate, love is deep. He starts mentioning attitudes, interpersonal relationships. So what we are growing now is a generation of Christians who, who look like Christians, but they have no character. And character is the function of father figures and mentors. And character is only designed to be fashioned. Mm-hmm. Eh? We are sitting in front of a board. Yes. Why this board look different from the wood? It's, they've used something called sandpaper. You see this thing? Yes. It's smooth. Eh? If you just get wood and put it together and make it table, it will not be fine. Yeah. Some paper means somebody polished it. And the process of polishing something is not very nice. Hey, that's some paper. My God, it's amazing. The Bible used that word in that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 about equip, equipping the church. Mm-hmm. It's not a small issue. It's, go- so it's like what- Jesus Christ saying, <clears throat> pruning. Uh, Thank you. Pruning. The vine. Thank it's you. Thank you. Hey. you prune. But what happens is that you come to a church, God puts you under a pastor, puts you under a man of God, the person who has been designed by God to fashion. He yeah? begins, you go, wow, that guy can't talk to me anyhow. I don't feel nice. You leave the church and go and join another church. Then you start going around. And the funny mm-hmm. thing is that if people interview and find out why you left, the way they were treating me, 
Yeah. No, it's not the way they were treating. It's that they were fashioning some. I've been redeemed now as a pastor for almost over 25 years. You understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that the church is a perfect church. We have yep. gone through a lot of things. But I have said that, you know, I came because God spoke to me. I'm not going to leave because I'm, I'm treated. <laughs> the day I leave, God will say, carry your bag and leave. You understand? But our generation today, they want to have churches where people treat them well. They are not helping you. You need to go to a place where people are, eh, why did you come late? You come 7.30, <laughs> somebody standing by the door like a headmaster. Anyway, this is the house of God, my friend. Why have you come late? No, those guys, are they're not treating us well. Then you find him, the youth, he goes out. Now, he doesn't know that that test is going to find it one day when he gets a job. He thinks the pastor is persecuting him. He doesn't know that God has sent that man to polish that attitude because mm -hmm. it's going to disturb his destiny in the future. And guess what? Because he has not passed the test, he faces it as a Christian working in a bank. He comes late, 8.30, he's arriving at work, thinking that his boss is going to treat him like his pastor. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that the pastor is worried about attendance. The boss is productive. He wants results. You understand? You know? So then he gets into an altercation with his boss and he gets mm -hmm. fired. Why? Because he came late consistently or does not know how to prepare reports or does not know how to package himself publicly or does not know how to treat clients. Mm -hmm. You understand? So what he failed to get in the church, it starts affecting him now in life. He can't keep a marriage. He's not loyal to anybody. His wife talks to him one day, he gets up in the morning, that girl doesn't respect me, man. I'm leaving this marriage. <laughs> so he starts showing up in all these things that you have. So what yeah. we have today is a discipline issue. The church needs to go back to the issue of discipline. We have to have strong, father, strong figures, father or mother figures, People can tell you the truth. When I do mentorship, and I've been doing it over 25 years in Zambia, I don't go there and say, oh, you're going to make it. I tell them, my friend, <laughs> uh, God is an actual person. He responds to action. So if your pastor prophesy and give you the team of the year, if you don't put that thing to work, you are going to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> you get me? You have to be practical. You can't just sit down and think heaven is going to come. You have to, there's something to be paid for. Yeah. Somebody has to pay for it. So that is the challenge. So you can imagine that generation of indisciplined people getting married, mm -hmm. running ministries. A lot of them are, ah, ah, wow. So you, 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 all those now excesses, you start seeing it. You start seeing it. Why? Because nobody so, um, has done the polishing. Yes. Mentorship. Very important. I, yes, we have a lot of things happening. Um, so one, a young person would say that, okay, yes, I need mentorship, but mm. where do I find this mentorship? If, quote unquote, my spiritual leaders are the ones going astray as well. So there are all these excuses being put out. But then I'm, I'm thinking through for somebody who, is, who stumbled or watched this episode, how then do they navigate? How do they find themselves? How do they correct the error they are living in. Okay, so the, the, the first thing to do is to find somebody you can follow. Okay. That's what I always do. Find somebody you can follow. And the yastic will be his lifestyle, mm -hmm. not what he's saying, oh, church, you know, because now we follow results. Oh, the guy has 10,000 members. Oh, me too. I want to have 10,000. I go and submit. It's my papa now. And then, Spiritual and then father, et cetera, et cetera. They have and power. They then have, then you, start, you start going to, and then you start discovering a lot of excesses, you know. Yes. Real mentorship is about a person who you can design your life after. Mm -hmm. Very important. Not just the results, yeah. but the attitude and lifestyle. As Paul indicates, imitate me as I Correct. imitate Jesus Christ. And there's a, there's a lot to unpack there now. <laughs> because if we are going to imitate Jesus, let's start from there. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Let this mind be in you. Which was in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Who, though he was equal to God, did, did not, not. Think, think it's robbery yes. to be equated with God. Mm -hmm. But he took on the form of the servant and was obedient to the to death and obedient to the cross. Yes. You understand? Mm -hmm. That is the example. Jesus, God says one day, Sonny, I want somebody to die for the world. Jesus doesn't say, eh, we all, all got the idea now. Why didn't you go and, can't, can't you go and die for the world? Mm -hmm. The Bible says he behaved like Isaac. Who the God said, give me your son. And the father arrested Isaac, put him on the sacrificial 
altar Water. was about to kill Isaac. Isaac, who's 17 years old, the father is 117, we should be stronger. He didn't make any move because his father said, God said I should kill you. Hmm. Oh, that's another message. <laughs> another message for another time. Yeah. You know? But then God intervened and said, no, don't kill your child. And the, the rest we say is history. But then God killed Jesus on the cross, allowed him to die on the cross for something that he did not do. That's his son. You know? And he said that what I do is what I see my father do. Mm -hmm. You understand? And the Bible says because Jesus had that attitude, yes. God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name. Mm -hmm. At his name, every name must bow. So when Paul says, imitate Jesus, imitate me as I imitate Jesus, Apostle Paul was talking about the death to self, the death to the flesh, mm -hmm. the death to this world. Okay. And those three areas are the most important enemies of the Christian. In fact, I would say, the, the, the biggest challenge of our generation is the death to self. Because mm -hmm. Jesus is the one that said it. Any man that must come after me, must first deny himself, yes. take up his cross, and follow me. Who is teaching that guy message now? Nobody will attend your church. <laughs> you are, this is why you he's talking about dying. In fact, the church Jesus introduced that message. The 5,000 people scattered. <laughs> Only a few. <laughs> you see, it, it is a death to self. <sighs> The day, sometimes when I teach that message, I have to be very careful because when, when legally, when you are saying that you deny yourself, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it means you are denying yourself the privilege and rights that legally, you know, legal protection has given to you because you are obeying Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what it means, deny yourself. Go and do, do a dictionary search. So yeah. what does it mean to deny? When you say I deny myself, you are denying your personality. You are allowing somebody else to start telling you what is right, mm -hmm. what is wrong, tell you where to sit, tell you where to go. For example, I'm in Lusaka now, not because I chose to be here. It's because the church transferred me here. Yes. Eh, if I wanted to choose where to live in Zambia, I would go and stay in Mansa. Yeah. <laughs> or live in Mong. What am I doing in Lusaka? Mm -hmm. You know? But you see, because I'm under authority, the leadership of the church can transfer me and I've obeyed and I've been here now. I came in Lusaka in 2012. Yeah, 2012. I've been here in Lusaka now mm -hmm. for 12 years. Not because, okay, now I've moved to Chongwe because now another transfer came in 2019 and that's where the church is based. So all those things is what is missing in the church today. So a mentor I describe is not somebody who is just packaging your gift. It's somebody who has authority over you. Mm -hmm. Somebody whose, um, whose presence and his uh, accountability over your life is a protection against evil yeah. and misconduct. You understand? Because it's, it's, that, that's, that's what a father figure, an authority is. If you say you are submitting to somebody who can't control you, then that's not submission. Because I mean, when you are describing, if somebody tells you what to do and you like it, and you do it, that's called cooperation. <laughs> if the person tells you what you don't like to do and you do it, that's called submission. Okay. You, you think Jesus came to, want to wanted to die for the world? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> because the father said so. Yeah. He came, mm -hmm. you know. One time he was even praying, Father, let this cup pass before me. You know, after this, he said, nevertheless, let, or, let not I, but your will be done. be done. You understand? Because the Father said so. So you need to find somebody who can tell you off. Somebody who, whose presence will destroy your ego. Which I mean, it will, it will go after it, heavy. Mm -hmm. Not somebody who, every time you are in his presence, you are always uh, <clears throat> feeling good and stuff. Somebody who is working on the ego, which is why I always use the example of the military. Because, yeah. I mean, you get to the military, shave off your hair. I mean, they tell you where to sleep, when to eat, what to do with your life. And there are two people, professionals, the Bible compares us to, the, Christ, the soldier and the athlete. Mm -hmm. You understand? And if you look at the discipline of these two, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. the athlete, people are sleeping, he's waking up at 0-3. The coach has called him. Right. Come, let's start running. The soldier, the same thing. When people are busy enjoying themselves with their family, him is in the war front. And that's why studies have shown that they are the two people that live longer than every other human being because of discipline and because they've given their life off to mentorship. So that's what I would ask this generation to do. Don't be deceived by that, um, that uh, what's the word, rhetoric of oh, independence and freedom and liberty. It's a lie. Real, real safety is in the multitude of counselors. That safety it's not because they are talking to you. It's because they are, they've planted a restriction mm -hmm. against opportunities 
to destroy your destiny and destroy yourself. So allow somebody to have that authority over your life. And that's why I said, the person who has that must also have somebody. Yeah. Uh -huh. That is the yastic. So follow, follow, Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So the person who you must submit to, mm -hmm. it must be seen that he too is in, not Submitted. independent. Uh -huh. Who is he submitting to? <laughs> he just wakes up in the morning, he's the bishop is of his own soul. And then you go and submit <laughs> to him. Ah, he will just be talking to you anyhow. The day you have a prayer, don't forget that guy. Just walk away from that <laughs> church. I had a young pastor who came to see me was having problems with his with his uh, apostle and said, no, me, I'm leaving. I said, you can't leave. Again. Where? He testifies everywhere that I'm the only one who said he should not move anywhere. You know, so if you are going to start a church, it can't be because of problems. Mm -hmm. Let him be the one to release you. No, pastor, no, I'm going. I said, no, 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 no. You can't go anywhere. When you joined the church, the, 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 it was it treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and guess what? After a few months, his leader called him and said, it's like God has spoken to me. It's time to release you. Mm -hmm. And the man released him. He started the church. He was there. He gathered his team. It was a beautiful encounter. He thanks me every day that I'm the only one who stopped. Because me, I know. You can't move. Because, I mean, where will you go that you will not be mistreated? You, you, you go and leave a church and start a ministry because of how your leader treated you. Ah, You'll be raising a bunch of rebels. Though. Every day, the people will be rebelling. Today, you just put your foot down and issue. That guy has become like God. We are leaving. <laughs> So there's a lot of independent um, indiscipline, and that is coming because of what we have discussed, this liberal uh, approach, approach to this thing. And what we are talking about, you know, um, we, we tend to, people tend to, I had that misconception, I had to repent. People tend to think, oh, America, America. But you get to, America is a highly conservative society. Because, uh, hmm, you get there, women are at home taking care of children, the guys are the ones working. Yeah, hey, all these are going liberal, liberal society. Ah, it's a highly. Hmm. <laughs> of it's course, just a few states. Yes, that a are few liberal. States yes, and the aspect of the media in the Thank Africa you. is on the receiving end. end. Yes. yes. Yeah. So don't when you say no, America is not America. America is a. I was there now. Me too. My advice. first shock when I got there. <laughs> it's a typical conservative, judeo Christo society. Ah, heavy. So, you know, it's not a, everybody's. A, Dependent, everybody's doing what they like. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's a serious, your father can still talk to you anyhow. They are still children, we are still, even in their 40s, they still submit to their dads. And, eh, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I thought, ah, yeah, everybody just does. No, no, don't do what you like. There's somebody who you are accountable to. And that's the, that's the, that's the, the challenge, you know, of not understanding the power of education. Because if we did, we would have known that media is powerful. Yeah. The church would have known that perception is higher than truth. You can have the truth, ah, but what is perceived truth is higher than truth. That's yeah. why I keep on saying, any person can quote me anywhere. Coca-Cola is more popular than Jesus. I mean, you can say what you like. What I've said to you might not like it, but it's the truth. <laughs> yes. There are certain homes Coca-Cola has entered. Yeah, the but youth, Jesus, the Jesus is not there. Mm -hmm. they die far. Some people don't even know Jesus, but they know Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. Why? Media. So we need to take over the media space. And that's why I'm glad I'm here. Okay. Speaking of the media, yes, sir. you are a man of yeah. <laughs> many talents. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Thank you. You can yeah. sing, play, <laughs> cook, <laughs> act, write, <laughs> build houses, design homes, and I tell you, and fix cars and do, <laughs> do body work for cars and stuff. Yes. <laughs> so, in all these things. What's the importance of the Christian taking the leading role in pretty much all aspects of life? Because when, when social media was introduced, I feel it was only during COVID that the church in Zambia decided to say, oh, there's this Ugh. thing called social media. I do know you come from Nigeria. The Nigerian church started TV way before it was famous. No, they took time. Oh. They used to call it devil's box. <laughs> <laughs> the church is always behind, I tell you. But I'm, it's I'm, always I'm, behind. I'm, I'm using it in the space with Zambia. So yeah. Zambia greatly delayed. I think this is now yeah. when we are catching up with. And unfortunately, people have moved into AI now. Yes. <laughs> and we're still <laughs> lagging. Oh. Still like, it's a... Uh, satanic this. Satanic. And whatever, whatever. Nah. <laughs> That's why education is important. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Because if you... Not to interrupt your question. Yeah. 
I think it's because the people who pastor the church were not educated. Okay. Because there's no educated man who doesn't know the power of media mm -hmm. and platforms. Look at how today a guy who is sitting on a podcast, he can argue with a man of God who has been building a reputation for 40 years. Mm -hmm. A guy who has a huge following. Yes. Just one social media broadcast. He has been rubbished on it. Yep. The power of media. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, my, that's, that's my pain. That's why we say education is important. You know? Um, let me put it like this. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 4, there was a revival that took place because after the, the apostles were persecuted, they went and cried to God for power, for boldness. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says from verse 31 that the place where they were sh praying was shaking and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Verse 33, a lot of them received great grace and great power mm -hmm. to give witness to the re resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But by, by verse 34, he said none of them lacked. Yeah. Because 35 and 36 began to show that people who had lands began to sell them and the things that they sold were given to meet the needs of the poor. So I ask you, how did they buy the land? Where did they get the land from? Mm -hmm. Who gave them negotiation skills to be able to sell property and engage in business? Yeah. So revival by design. And I like it because we are, we are recording. You need, you, your next generation needs to hear it clear, carefully. True. Revival is not just about the restoration of the move of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in the place of prayer, in the place of the move of God. It's also the economic transformation of a nation. Yes. Because everywhere revival came, it, th that country also became an economic superpower, which now led to it becoming a, a, a military superpower. I can mm -hmm. give an example. England. Yes. Revival broke out in the UK, and the church now, that the UK church now became the forefront for Christianity around the world. Mm -hmm. Guess what happened? UK also became an economic power. UK also became a military power. Yes. When the UK began to drift away from its Christian values, its influence also began to reduce. Yes. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. Mm -hmm. But sin brings reproach to people. The US. The US now, it, it, I mean, by the time the revival broke out the Azusa Street in the 1900s, from that depression that it was going through, it became the house of revival and the move of God. Yeah. Also, the US became also the economic power of the world and also became the military power of the world. Yes. So you can literally trace revival, righteousness, and a conscious effort to live a life of purity with the transformation of a country. Yes. You understand me? So if the church does not see it that way, it will have revival which will not last. Why? Because it doesn't have the economic and the military and the substructure mm -hmm. to maintain that revival. Because a king will rise up that will switch it off. That's what has been happening. And that's the reason why, you know, you find out that everywhere there has been an econo a, a revival, there's economic transformation. You can literally um, measure it. Yeah. The, the spiritual barometer of a country determines its economic and military you know, barometer. It's like revival is actually not just about the restoration of prayer and the move of God. It's actually transformation of a country. Because those people, as the Holy Spirit comes upon them, starts giving them ideas. It starts giving them wisdom. Mm -hmm. I tell people, Holy Spirit is not just for making people fall in the church and then, you know, people are breaking our tears about and yeah, everybody's falling everywhere. And, you know, then people talk about, oh, people are falling. There's a falling. No, no. That falling, when you get up, what does it do? It starts triggering ideas. Yeah. Because by design, Holy Spirit is a spirit of information. Mm -hmm. Jesus called him the spirit of truth. So he gives, hmm, I, won't, I, I can't even begin to tell you this dimension, how a geologist one day was praying the spirit and God showed him that, you know, a, 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 a project that failed, his organization had failed, you know, to find oil in a place. And when he prayed in the spirit, he slept and he saw the Holy Ghost. He, came because he just saw a man standing with a blackboard his head was not showing, but it was with a chalk. I said, let me show you the graph of the place where oil is. I started plotting the geological graph mm -hmm. and showed the geologists where the oil would be found. That guy got up from the dream and started writing. Raging. Went to his boss. Guys, I know where the oil is. You, you are just a junior engineer. What do you know? So I'm telling you, it's okay. If, you, if this thing doesn't work, you lose your job. He plotted the graph. The organization took him, took him seriously. When they followed his resolution, they found oil in a place where it should not be. That guy, as I speak to you, is a public speaker everywhere. Mm -hmm. He's making, he's a multi-million dollar guy now. He's not a small boy anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, another one, 
he was told by the Holy Spirit to tie balloons and use them for decorations in the sleep. She woke up and started using balloons. That's when balloons became... <laughs> balloons were things children used to play. That woman was the first person who started, who found a way to tie balloons and create shapes from them. She yeah. made money from it. I can give you oh, ideas, ideas, you know, um, because the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. Yeah. It means he's the spirit of creativity, ideas, and when he's on people, people start thinking solution, solution, solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible says the children of Israel faced bitter waters and Moses prayed and God showed him a tree to put in water and that tree made that place, that water that was bitter. Sweet. It made it sweet. That's solution. You can package that water now in that community and start giving the community and selling a bottle water. Mm -hmm. This water now you call bottle water. Somebody, that inspiration came. Satan has no inspiration because he's not a giver. He's a thief. He has no ability to create anything. Anywhere you see creativity, it means God is involved. You know? So that is my view. Um, we must stop looking at revival as just, oh, people gathering in church and following, oh, miracles, cripples walking. Solution. The spirit of God. The spirit of light. The spirit of truth. It brings development. It brings transformation. And as we follow God, that thing mm -hmm. will start showing in the country. People will start, look at now. You know, America is the country that had the largest move of God. What happened? They started producing millionaires. Who is the richest man in Africa? <laughs> Where is the revival now heavy in, in, in the world now? Nigeria. Guess who, who, how many billionaires do you think Nigeria has produced in the last 20 years? A lot. Uh, <laughs> you can't, you can't, it's automatic. You, yeah. can't, you can't remove revival and economic transformation and influence. Mm -hmm. You understand? I mean, even Nigerian soccer players, they, I mean, they are, it's incredible. Yeah. Half of the songs we sing today are Nigerian songs. Those days were the other way, man. They're American songs. <laughs> The Americans were the ones we were for. Now everything is Nigeria, Nigeria, because that's where, that's the center of the move of God now. And since Zambians are going to drink from it a lot, it means that revival is coming here. And I believe strongly that Zambia's destiny is to be the country that will be the hero. It's the last frontier for the gospel on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, it's the one that will be, be, be championing the move of God in the last days. And I think that that's basically one of the reasons why I was sent here. Okay. Yes, sir. Awesome. This 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 has been like we'll need a part two because I, I tell haven't you. dealt with other oh yeah things and aspects of your life and oh, yeah. your ministry and training. We okay. haven't dealt with that. However, before we close, um there's been a certain hunger for Jesus mm. and all. And so does a good thing. However, it wasn't in his right to do it. Mm. And God says obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm. We have young people on fire for Jesus, mm. burnt with zeal, mm. but are not obedient. Even as we close, what, what are your words to young people watching this? Well... Um, that's a very good question. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Um, Samuel was serving. Okay, let me put it like this. You see, when our generation is a generation of excuses, you know, we like to have credence and reason to do something. Yeah. So when you ask a young person, why are you doing that? It's because of. It's because of. So it's, we are the because of yes. generation. So I teach that... Um, how then do you follow a man in dishonor? Mm -hmm. Because following a man in, on, in honor is simple. Yeah. But how do you follow a man in dishonor? <laughs> and guess what? Most of the most powerful leaders in the next generation followed men who God had either rejected or God did not want to have anything to do with or God had chosen them as option to the, that, that guy because he failed. Let's mm -hmm. start with Moses. I mean, here's God telling Moses, you guys, my friend, you can't see the promised land. Go and anoint Joshua. He's the one taking over from you. Mm -hmm. And that's the man you are serving. The man who will not see the promised land. Yeah. You know? And here comes Elijah. Elijah gets tired. No, he wants to die. He wants to go away. God says, okay, you are tired. Get out of the stage. Go and give it to Elijah. And the day he goes to call Elijah, he gives him a slap, actually. <laughs> like we say, he struck him. Say, the man said, let me go and bury my father. He said, get out from here. Go and bury your parents. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. You understand? How do you serve a man in dishonor? Another example is Samuel. How do you serve a man? The Bible records, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. He says, no open heaven. God was not talking to anybody. Yeah. But Samuel was by that altar serving faithfully. You see, 
um, what I will say is what you have said now. To obey is better than sacrifice. God expects that we should be a generation under authority. We should be a generation in submission. Whatever the generation in front of us is doing is not the issue. It's how we are relating to them that is the issue. We should be the bridge for the next generation. You know, we should start encouraging young people to learn to um, um, obey the scriptures, even when it's not convenient. Mm -hmm. Because God, you can't give excuses to God because God does not in respect of anybody. You can't say that because somebody did this to you, you have a right to do that to the other person. You maintain what you have control over, which is why there's going to be judgment. Mm -hmm. Because what people don't teach people is that as God is going to judge all believers, Christians have their own judgment. I hope you know. Yes. Uh, because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I've had the privilege of being in that judgment. <laughs> God gave me a preview. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a funny issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a In fact, I I just woke up and found men, men of God standing in the clouds and all of our had files. And at the far end, there was some big boys with tape with huge tables with everybody's document. And everybody's going, this mighty men of God. And everybody's shaking, shaking, you know. And they get to my turn and they give me certain instructions that they are giving me another opportunity to go and correct it, you know. And I've, from that time, I've not been the same, mm -hmm. you know. So the, the youth must remember, you are also going to face your judgment. Yeah. And in that judgment, they're not going to say, oh, because you had a bad leader, that's why you became bad. Or because you did not have the right training, that's why. Mm -hmm. God doesn't listen to excuses. He said in the time of old, God has permission. But in these days, commands mm -hmm. all men to repent, you know. So there's no excuse. You must stay under authority. Mm -hmm. Focus on your goals. Focus on the assignment you have with God. And focus on a personal relationship with God. Don't get yourself entrenched with things that don't concern you. Mm -hmm. Another person's lifestyle is none of your business. You know, you concent concentrate on your lifestyle. Spend time mm -hmm. finding about yourself, who you yeah. are, your strengths, your weaknesses, you know, what you can do, your opportunities. Focus on yourself. And you know, Jesus even said it, eh? Yeah. He said, you can, you can only love your neighbor as much as, as you, you love yourself. yourself. So if you don't know how to love yourself, how can you love the next person? Mm -hmm. So it means the self-discovery, the self-love, it's a place to go. That's not selfish. Because Jesus is the one that taught us. Because you can't give what you don't have. Yeah. So I think for young people, um, they should stop focusing on other people and spend time taking care of their own personal relationship with God, their own lifestyle, their own visions, their own... So that when um, they reach an age like mine, they will be able to say, I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. Like me, I have no regrets that I came to Zambia. I mean, I have no regrets. You know, at the end of the day, I followed my passion. And it has landed me uh, <laughs> sometimes in trouble, <laughs> other times great opportunities. I've met a lot of wonderful young people. I was just from an interview about youths and told them that people should not complain about youths. Youths just need to be given a platform to express themselves. Yeah. So if you are watching me and you're listening to me out there, I want you to know that we believe in you. Mm -hmm. We trust God for your life and that you'll be greater than us. That's our prayer. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Pastor, doctor. Patrick Osagi. Yes, sir. We can talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I am truly honored to be able to have this conversation yes, with yes. you. Yes. And yeah, like looking forward to to another conversation so okay. that we dive deeper and talk yes, about other Very aspects much. of life. And Very much. Yeah, you have more to pour out. Amen. Too much. All, all these. You can see just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see too much to pour. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Paul writing to Timothy, telling him to say, "Study to show yourself an approved workman of God, rightly dividing the word of truth." Yes, sir. And uh, we are we are seeing that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, to God be yeah. the glory, sir. <laughs> Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you have been impacted, transformed, as well as inspired. Remember to like, share, subscribe, share this with somebody. If you've heard this and have been blessed, share this with somebody so that minds can be transformed, so that we can be inspired unto greater works. Psalm 119 and verse 9 says, How can a young person keep his ways pure? Verse 11 tells us that I have hidden your word inside my heart mm. that I may not sin against you. Mm. 106, I think, well, 103 tells us that your, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm. So hold on to God's word as Joshua 1 and verse 8 tells us to say. 
meditate on this book of the law day and night. Meditate on God's word that it may guide us and that it may make us walk into righteousness and purity. So from me, Dennis Movanga Kawe and the Movanga podcast team, it's bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. You can see that. The All right. So you actually um, answered the, the, the question. Uh, what is your... I don't need that. No. Don't put me in problem. No. So what is you actually um, having a conversation? So like, why is it uh, West Africans, in particularly in uh, Nigeria, like... Uh, successful in almost everything. We, we, we talk of football, uh, music, like almost everything creative, you know. And uh, there was this time, uh, there's this uh, podcast in Zambia, which is um, a growth uh, podcast. And the, um, one of the Nigerians was actually uh, invited at, at, at uh, that particular podcast. And with him, he actually uh, mentioned that uh, because, you know, um, the population uh, is, is so high and, you know, people always, you know, want to give, you know, their the, the, the best, like they always deliver their best, you know, while others open their shops at maybe seven, but there's someone who wakes up at zero three and opens uh, their shop. So why is it that uh, people from the West, like usually are uh, so much successful in a lot of things? Okay. What I would say is that um, um, the society, the environment is what determines that. The environment will, is what drives the people. Um, to give you context, Nigeria is over 60-something years old, but most of those 60-something years has been ruled by the military. You understand? So a military is not negotiation. You can't go and tell a military man, oh, no, I want to think about this. Everything is militant in nature. The educational system. In class, your teacher is telling you something. You, you say you don't understand. We tell you, get out, go and read on your own. <laughs> Don't waste my time. So, because of that, the society, there's some truth in what that person said about the fact that of the population. But I tend to want to avoid that because there are many other nations that are around the world that have huge populations that have very docile people. You understand? I think the reason is because, you know, um, the society, the environment itself is what creates that kind of person. The, 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 the drive to succeed, the the need to want to make it, the, the, the understanding that nobody is going to build your future for you, the, the lack of dependency syndrome. And I think that, that realization is what has helped the West Africans a, a lot, Nigerians in particular. You don't want to depend on anybody because every person you're depending on, government, family, relatives have failed you. So you have to push, you know. Uh, somebody once said, give me an information about some students in China and about how, stu- I won't mention the part of the country because it's a podcast, you know that the, these children, that there was a, such a difference that the children from a particular part of Africa were calling their parents to ask for money, that the, these ch- other children from this other part of Africa were asking their parents to loan them money. And then the other ones did not even call their parents at all. They got to China, they set up businesses. Before they realized it, they started running half of the, both half of the street. Um, um, somebody asked me, he said, uh, yeah, even... Wh- I mean, how did they succeed? So they started going to interview that guy. He said, your problem is that you guys like to be dependent. You like to think that somebody owes you something. You have this sense of privilege and sense of, uh, I think, what's the, what the, what's the word? The, 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 the entitlement, yes. You know, that, that's what is affecting that block of Africa, that the West Africans have conquered it. But another generation of West Africans is also coming up who are also feeling like they're entitled. You know, uh, so they, they, that's what is disturbing the young people, and that's what has helped uh, Nigerians. They are driven. I've just told you my story now. You can tell from my story. I have reasons to become what I am supposed to become. You're radical. I don't have. I'm radical. I don't have time to play. As I'm leaving you now, I'm checking the tax. I'm going for another meeting. <laughs> hey, at 18 hours, I must be somewhere. I may, and I'm, as I'm doing that, I'm juggling between being a father, being a husband, pastoring 14 churches, and looking after. 14 countries for the youths and young adults because I'm the one looking after all the youths of the Sadiq region for the redeemed Christian Church of God. That's not a small job. On top of that, I find time to write a song. I find time to do my albums. I'm doing videos. I act movies. I find time to build my own stuff. We are building churches. We are doing... <laughs> <laughs> because nobody's going to do it for me. So mm-hmm. I think that's the reason why 
West Africans are driven. It is that military um, society that was created and the fact that a lot of us arrived to find him. We were not uh, taught that we are entitled to something. We, are, we have to fight for it. You are not taught that somebody owes you something. Mm -hmm. You felt it was a privilege for somebody to give you something. So that created a certain lifestyle which is affecting the kind of results you are seeing now all over the world. Uh, it's very difficult to compete with Nigeria because it's already driven. I mean, it's already driven. You have to, a lot of people have to wake themselves. So him is already woken up. You understand? He doesn't need anything to wake him up because he doesn't want to go back to his suffering and the hunger. That he, I mean, I was so shocked that in Zambia, your government even give you bursary for going to school. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something else. I mean, yeah. who is going to give you money if you like, don't come. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. We'll go on. <laughs>